tonight, remembering a man who changed the course of the world. Mikhail Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, dead at 91. Gorbachev was a visionary, the opposite of what we're, we're witnessing now with this reckless and unacceptable war in Ukraine. As the Russian president wages a bloody war to restore parts of the Soviet Union, we're on the front lines tonight. Just an ongoing terrorizing of the people here in Kharkiv. The flood catastrophe unfolding in Pakistan. The Pakistani people are facing a monsoon on steroids. And the Canadians stepping up to help out. And one of Canada's biggest bands pulled off the radio. I want to go see them. I do, but I can't justify it. This is The National. Tonight, the world remembers Mikhail Gorbachev, the last man to lead the Soviet Union, changed the course of history. But his death now also highlights a grim and violent irony. In the 1980s, Gorbachev led the faltering Soviet Union to engage with the West, ratcheted down the arms race and began the demise of the Cold War. Now, Russian leader Vladimir Putin seems bent on reversing the freedoms Gorbachev fought for as an isolated Russia seeks to reclaim a lost empire that ruled Ukraine and beyond. Gorbachev's legacy is divided. There's the way many Russians view him and the way the rest of the world does. Sasha Petrasik begins our coverage. Mikhail Gorbachev will always be remembered as the last Soviet leader, the one who ended the Soviet Union. Unusually young by Russian standards, he came to power challenging many of the country's inefficiencies and dogmas. Surprisingly personable, he waded into crowds where his predecessors suppressed them. Under Gorbachev's radical economic and political reforms, dubbed perestroika, communism crumbled. And so did the Iron Curtain that separated Moscow's puppet regimes in Eastern Europe from the West. In an interview with CBC 20 years after the end of the Cold War, he insisted this was the right course. I am really proud of what happened. It was a very thorny path. At home, that created many enemies. On one side, an old guard being swept away. On the other, firebrand liberals like Boris Yeltsin for whom Gorbachev wasn't moving quickly enough. He was much more popular in the West, reaching out to U.S. Presidents Ronald Reagan and George Bush, seen as a man they could do business with, taking the edge off Cold War rivalries. Abroad, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. At home, he survived a coup attempt in 1991. And even now, Russian President Vladimir Putin uses what he calls Gorbachev's failures as justification for his own heavy hand. And I think the younger generation of Russians who've been schooled under Putin will vilify Gorbachev as a man who sort of lost the, the empire and who gave in to these uh, foreign Western influences. Today, former Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney remembered his Soviet counterpart. He sought restraint on the exercise of military power. And this is the opposite of what we're witnessing now with this reckless and unacceptable war uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Two Gorbachev legacies that remain unreconciled, even in death. Sasha Petrusik, CBC News, Toronto. Bringing in our Chris Brown in London tonight, because Chris spent many years uh, covering Russia. Chris, your impressions about how Russians themselves felt about Gorbachev? Well, David, it's really quite striking the difference in how he was perceived in Russia versus seen in the West. Russian propagandists have spent a lot of time demonizing Gorbachev as the man responsible for ending the Soviet Union. Vladimir Putin never really had a kind word for him. And within Russian society, generally, there was little thanks for Gorbachev for ending communism. We once, I uh, remember, chatted with people on the street uh, around his 90th birthday. And I remember people mostly shrugging. And in fact, the lack of this legacy 
for Gorbachev is a good example of how Vladimir Putin has basically rewritten many parts of Russian history. For example, school textbooks now blame the Allies for starting the Second World War. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he's not seen as, uh, as, as someone who contributed much. Uh, the 90s are seen as a time of chaos when really, in fact, it was a blossoming uh, time for civil society movements. What do we know about how Gorbachev saw Putin's war with Ukraine? We know that he was worried back in 2014 about a bigger war, also angry with the United States, accused them of arrogance. But in the last few months, we're told that uh, he told friends that he was very angry with Putin for undoing all of his accomplishments and all the progress that perestroika had set in motion. Chris Brown, always appreciate your insight. Thank you. Thanks, David. The end of the Soviet Union marked the independence of Ukraine, and tonight, Volodymyr Zelensky oversees a major counteroffensive to preserve it. Active military engagement is now happening all along the front line, he said in a national address. Ukraine is now driving to retake occupied territory on a large scale. It claims to have punched through Russia's first line of defense near Kherson, another big goal reclaiming more territory around Kharkiv, which Russia has bombarded throughout the war, including today. Our Susan Ormiston was in Kharkiv when the deadly attacks unfolded. Tonight, she shows us the grief, loss and resilience of those in the aftermath of yet another assault. As fighting ramps up in the south, unrelenting Russian attacks in the east, in Kharkiv. We arrived here shortly after a strike, mid-morning. A cafe chair splintered. Someone was badly injured here or died. The mayor counted four deaths and 11 injured in separate strikes. The owner of a shattered pharmacy measures out the damage, angry. They do it in the middle of the day. They're barbarians, says Oleksandr Maltsev. A caregiver, Valentina Pisareva, rushed here to help her patient. Since the start of the war, we've been sleeping in the basement. At night, I'm lying and counting the hits, and then in the morning, I turn on the TV to hear about them. She climbs the stairs through broken glass, five floors, heavy steps. Saddened by this war and its carnage, a pensioner, she has nowhere else to go. A woman in the top apartment doesn't want to speak with us. She has disabilities. Yes, you were upset. Dennis, a volunteer, has shown up to help. It's uh, such a strange war. How do you mean? War against civils, mostly. A young man, Alexander, checks out his apartment. He'd left for work just 30 minutes before the strike. I don't think their target was our building, he says. Our mayor said the shelling was random. Random shelling, too familiar. A cleanup crew knows its job well, dispatched by the city. A soldier excavates to find fragments and the fuse, clues to what actually hit. Kharkiv is just 40 kilometers from the Russian border. Kharkiv is a strategic place for Russians and Ukrainians. Ukrainians hold this city, the second largest in Ukraine, but they are under constant bombardment. In the city center over the weekend, two large missiles leaving huge craters, just an ongoing terrorizing of the people here in Kharkiv. Another strike on an inexplicable target, a kindergarten yard. The kids were gone, but two teachers were wounded. There's no warning where the next shells will land. As the front lines shift and move, this city remains a target, and those left pray for an end. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Kharkiv. Shelling in another part of Ukraine has raised the very real possibility of nuclear disaster. Now international inspectors will visit a plant in the center of the fighting. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you again. Good, good. Are you safe, family? That's a UN team arriving in Ukraine to examine the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear plant. It has sustained considerable damage in the fighting, raising fears of a radiation leak or even a meltdown. Ukrainian authorities are now distributing iodine tablets and running emergency drills. Now to the unfolding disaster in Pakistan and what the United Nations says is a warning to the world about the devastating effects of climate change. 
Tonight, a third of the country is underwater. More than 1,100 people are dead and over a million homes damaged or destroyed after months of torrential rain unleashed catastrophic floods. And with more rain in the forecast and so many with nowhere to go, there are warnings on the ground of a spiraling humanitarian disaster. Salima Shivji shows us the growing desperation. The relentless rains may have stopped for a spell, but the deluge is everywhere. The devastation complete. Huge swaths of land, a full third of the country, now underwater, with millions of Pakistanis forced to scramble for shelter on whatever dry square of land they can find. That reality is barely sinking in. We lost everything in the water. We only escaped with a few things, this man says. Now we sit here out in the open. At the mercy of the elements, the heat stifling. This farmer has been sleeping outside for a week. Only now has he gathered enough supplies to build a meager roof for his family. We have nothing. I can't even feed my children, he says. We need help. That need is acute all across Pakistan's four provinces, where thousands of homes and roads are now gone. An estimated $10 billion in damages in a country already in the throes of an economic crisis. At the moment, our main concern is to save lives. And aid workers are struggling to keep up and get to those in need. Uh, it's really, really devastating. The infrastructure has been completely decimated. Um, and you know, this is not the only worry. When the water subsides, it's all the waterborne diseases that we're afraid will come. The United Nations has sent out an urgent call for millions of dollars in international aid for a country that has barely contributed to global emissions and yet is suffering disproportionately from the effects of climate change. The Pakistani people are facing a monsoon on steroids, the relentless impact of epochal levels of rain and flooding. Today, it is Pakistan. Tomorrow, it could be your country. But relief is still far off, with the waters of Pakistan's main rivers so swollen and more rain to come later in the week. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. We've got CBC News senior meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff with us. Uh, Johanna, can you walk us through how the changing climate is making monsoon season worse? Well, David, we know straight up that a warming climate is intensifying the water cycle. You know, warmer air holds more moisture, and this means more intense rainfall and flooding for some regions, but it's also affecting rainfall patterns like monsoons. And this year, the region has seen a full eight weeks of unbroken cycles of nonstop torrents. And that means not only flash floods, but river embankments destroyed. So villages that would have normally, normally been protected are getting this massive uh, volume of water. There are, of course, other factors, deforestation, loss of glaciers. It's also a La Nina year. The natural oscillations in the Pacific Ocean can mean more monsoon rain. But we now have the tools in place that can rapidly assess exactly how much of a factor climate change has been. Climate scientists right now are working on figuring out just how much more likely climate change has made this event. And I suspect the chances of it happening again in the future are much more likely. According to a 2021 study, global heating is making this monsoon more intense and more erratic. About a one degree Celsius rise in global temperature is leading to 5% more rain. But David, the good news, at least for now, is that we are nearing the end of this year's monsoon season. Oh, indeed. Johanna Wagstaff, thanks very much. You're welcome. Next week, the head of the UN is expected to travel to Pakistan to see that damage firsthand, while community groups here in Canada are working to get more aid into the country. Cam McIntosh reports. When the devastation is so widespread, just figuring out where to start is a huge task. It compelled me to go. Mazrur Khan has just arrived in Islamabad from Winnipeg to get a feel for the ground. He's president of the Canada-Pakistan Trade and Cultural Association of Manitoba. He's trying to figure out where help from Manitoba should go. I intend to go to areas and uh, figure out and guide and assist my team. They aren't the only ones getting going. Scarborough-based Muslim Welfare Canada runs an office in Karachi. It's raised $100,000 so far, focusing right now on food aid. All the employees were uh, working day and night uh, right now because we have a, a problem with the flooding uh, all over the country. 
So far, the Canadian government has committed $5 million in upfront aid. We will continue to stand with the people of Pakistan. We need uh, world community support. Pakistan's High Commissioner to Canada says developed nations share a global onus to help. We would hope that after the first uh, relief efforts are concluded, uh, Canada and its agencies are going to uh, assist us. The International Development Minister says the Canadian government may also match donated funds. Rest assured, we want to make sure that as a needs assessment comes in, we'll look at what Canada will, uh, will do. Meanwhile, in Winnipeg's Pakistani community, fundraisers are being planned. We're going to do everything possible in our, um, in our capacity living in Winnipeg to help out. My heart beats out for all my brothers and sisters in Pakistan. Meanwhile, the Canadian Red Cross says it will likely have something to announce soon about aiding a recovery that will likely take years. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. The RCMP confirmed today it is investigating this widely shared video. Christia, yes. what the f are you doing in Alberta? You f***ing traitor. A man verbally accosted Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland in Grand Prairie, Alberta. An RCMP spokesperson says the force takes threats against public officials seriously. If the circumstances meet the threshold for a criminal charge, then an arrest could follow. A number of mainstream politicians have condemned that confrontation. Many are also revealing their own experience of threats and intimidation. As Quebec's provincial election campaign ends its third day, Alison Northcott asks how safe some candidates feel. The security at this campaign stop in Montreal is hard to overlook. Multiple police vehicles, an officer at the door. I am adapting to that new reality. Quebec Solidaire co-spokesperson Gabrielle Nadeau-Dubois says the extra protection is a sign of rising tensions. We need to ask ourselves the question, why are we going in that direction? Do we want to go, do we want to see in Quebec or Canada the kind of scenes that we have saw in the United States, for example? Christian, yes. what the f*** are you doing in Alberta? The scene in Alberta Friday is just one example of aggression and threats some public figures are facing, including death threats to United Conservative Party leadership candidates say they've received. In Quebec, it's been 10 years since the election night shooting, which left one man dead during Parti Québécois leader Pauline Marois' victory speech. There's more security. That's up to the Sûreté du Québec to decide what's appropriate. Today's PQ leader says for this campaign, he was offered a bulletproof vest. It's more polarized. The political climate maybe has changed. Still, some candidates say they're unfazed. I'm not concerned, uh, and I have full confidence in the SQ. I had to stop watching it the first time. For the mayor of Calgary, what happened to Freeland was disturbing, reminding her of her own experiences, including at a debate in 2017. And this man came up and felt that he could loom over me and say, I'm the one that called you and told you I know where you live and I'll make sure you never win this election. This national security expert says his fear is a possible attack. The individuals that will be capable to go through a, a crowd, get close enough to uh, do something. And that's probably one of the reasons why, particularly during the uh, Quebec election, we're seeing a very visible presence of security officers. Quebec provincial police are urging anyone, including politicians, not to tolerate threats and report them to police. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Changes are coming to the federal cabinet. CBC News has confirmed a minor shuffle tomorrow. Canadian press reporting it will involve Public Services and Procurement Minister Philomena Tassi, who has asked to change jobs due to a family health matter. And CBC News has learned that six candidates have been approved to run for the Green Party leadership, two independently. The other four are expected to run in pairs under a proposed co-leadership model. In one of those teams, former leader Elizabeth May. The race is expected to be decided on November 19th. Amid multiple allegations of sexual misconduct against frontman Wynn Butler, Canadian indie band Arcade Fire launched its international tour tonight. Those allegations have not been proven, but as Thomas Dagg shows us, some fans want their tickets refunded. Bright lights, loud music, and the crowd singing every word. Facing calls to cancel their tour, 
Arcade Fire instead put on their concert in Dublin as planned, even as some fans stayed home. I want to go see them. I do, but I can't justify it. Kate McCreesh and her husband James have gone to see the band nine times, from Atlanta to Edinburgh. Now for this show, they're demanding a refund. It is not right at all, so I'm not, I'm not going to support him. Over the weekend, music website Pitchfork published accounts from former fans detailing alleged sexual misconduct by frontman Wynn Butler. He told the website the encounters were consensual, but added, I am very sorry to anyone who I have hurt with my behavior. They should offer refunds to fans who don't feel like good about going to see them play. Just weeks ago at the Oceaga Festival, Arcade Fire reigned as Montreal royalty, a band that for years fostered an image as a family. With Butler and his wife Régine Chassang together, the face of Arcade Fire, racking up Junos, a Grammy, and fans worldwide. Band members even sometimes dancing in disguise amid their crowd. In a way, it feels like we are closer to our audience than we, than we have been before. Now, though, Indy 88 in Toronto and CBC Music across Canada are among the radio stations pulling Arcade Fire's songs from regular rotation, and some in the U.S. are doing the same. Almost all of the stations that I looked at that routinely played them dropped Arcade Fire by sometime probably on Monday. The band is scheduled to come play shows here in Canada at the end of the year to cap off their international tour. As it stands, no one is getting a refund. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. There is concern tonight students have fallen behind on more than just their studies over the pandemic. We're not going to see the repercussions of this for years to come. The push to make sure kids catch up on routine vaccinations. I'm glad that I'm getting this done before school starts. Plus what may have poisoned a dozen people who ate at the same restaurant. The lethal dose in humans can be as little as two milligrams. It's kind of the size of a sesame seed. And a recording studio celebrates a half century of making Canadian music. I was the first one, I think, other than the writers to hear Black Velvet. We're back in two. We have new details tonight on the suspected poisoning of several people at a restaurant near Toronto. Here's Farah Morali with what we know. The doors remain closed at Delight Restaurant and Barbecue in Markham, Ontario. As public health officials try to understand just how 12 people became seriously ill after eating here on Sunday. What we're working uh, assumption right now is a particular spice that was used uh, in that dish at that time. York Region Public Health confirms it's investigating whether a chicken-based dish was what sent four people to the ICU with symptoms ranging from numbness, vomiting and cardiac arrhythmia. It's our understanding that the more they consumed, the more likely it was that they have severe symptoms. The suspected contaminant Aconite. The lethal dose in humans can be as little as two milligrams, you know, which is a very small amount. It's kind of the size of a sesame seed. Um, so the dose that each patient got must have been much, much lower than that if they're already on the path to recovery. Aconite is used in traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine in South Asia, but only after being processed. The question is, how did it get into a meal? I've not come across a case before where it's been a food involved poisoning. So these are flower buds here. The news came as a surprise to Roger Gettick. He studied the plant that aconite comes from, also known as monkshood or wolfsbane. He says the most potent parts are the roots, which can be confused with other similar roots. That was my initial thing is why would aconite be in a restaurant or if it got mixed up with something, would it be something like ginger? But normally, it's unusual to hear about it at all. While public health suspects it is aconite poisoning, it's awaiting lab results to confirm. In the meantime, they're working with provincial and federal authorities to figure out whether any more of the suspected contaminated spice is out there. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. As kids get ready for school in a few days, parents might want to consider adding vaccinations to the to-do list. A new survey shows thousands of students in Ontario have fallen behind on routine shots. Ali Chiasson shows us the details and the concern. 
Kids and parents rely on schools for vaccine access. When the school program stops, it, it really is a hazard in terms of uptake of vaccine. That confirmed by a new survey from the University of Toronto and vaccine advocacy group 19 to 0. Asked whether their children missed their school given HPV, hepatitis B or meningococcal vaccine since the pandemic started, just over half said they got them elsewhere, but the rest said they either weren't sure or yes, their child definitely missed those vaccines. Ontario closed more schools than our schools for a longer time than any other province. And in terms of the school programs for immunization, Ontario is the most behind of other provinces. Public Health Ontario data shows that less than 1% of grade 7 kids during the pandemic were up to date on their HPV shots. And in that same 2020-2021 school year, only 17% of those kids got their Hep B and meningococcal vaccines. We're not going to see the repercussions of this for years to come. This family doctor says it needs to be addressed ASAP. Just last week, Toronto already saw a small outbreak of meningococcal disease in three people turn deadly. So when it comes to that vaccine, got to get that number a lot higher than it is in order to keep our kids safe. So I was like, oh, I got to get on that. <laughs> After the last chaotic two and a half years of pandemic parenting, Romana Siddiqui decided today was the day to get her kids up to date. So all three of your kids will be caught up on their vaccines come September. Do you feel relieved? I'm glad that I'm getting this done before school starts um, because again, with the hecticness of back to school, it, I, it's a very easy thing to slip through the cracks. Experts say public health clinics, as well as family physicians and pharmacists, need to work in tandem to fill in some of those cracks and ensure more children get caught up on their boosters. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. It's not just vaccinations. A lot of students will have to catch up on learning when they return to school this year. I don't think it's really fair how fast we do one thing and then once we finally get used to it, we quickly move to another. Getting kids back up to speed after two years of pandemic interruptions. But up next... It's been 50 wonderful years that I didn't expect. The Canadian Recording Studio celebrates a half century of making music and sets its sights on the next generation. Teenage head Alana Miles, Sharon, Lois and Bram. What do these Canadian acts have in common? Well, they've all been clients of a recording studio in Toronto, one that's celebrating a 50 year milestone this year. Talia Ricci spoke with its owner about the studio's half-century history in iconic Kensington Market and what comes next. How you your love in your dreams. It's unbelievable like, to think that, I mean, it, it's exactly the way it was, like 72. Nothing's changed. Hi, my name is Faisy Tab and I'm the owner of Kensington Sound in Toronto. Oh, oh, I'm second from the right. I would have been 22. We weren't very good <laughs> as a band. And I just fell in love with the process of recording. I went, oh my God, this is what I want to do. What kind of things does this 50 year anniversary have you reflecting on, like, you know, in terms of your accomplishments here and some of the people that you've worked with? It's gone through so many phases. We were the number one punk studio in the 80s. Three years later we became a reggae studio. We did nothing but reggae in here. And then we went country and then we went jazz. The two albums that symbolize the eclecticness of Kensington Sound are, are we've done two platinum albums, one for Teenage Head, of course, which is a raucous punk band. One elephant went up to play. And the other platinum album we have is Sharon Lois and Bram. Right? Children's album. The Lana Miles. I was the first one, I think, other than the writers to hear Black Velvet. We bought some less well known gear that stood the test of time. And this is one of them. This is called a Midas console. And it's a recording console that was built in Britain, hand wired. So we have serial number 001. <laughs> we have the prototype, and it's still working, and it still sounds wonderful. Stand by. Open the door so I can feel way more. What do you see for the future of Kensington Sound? 
We're forming a company, a record style company called Bipocular Arts. And what we're trying to do is create a stable, welcoming environment for a diverse, up and coming young talent. I want to shift it from sort of what I refer to as repeat clients from my past to the next generation coming up. I'm changing your name from buddy to babe. And I used to love in this way. You knew it was special. You had no comments or complaints. I first was introduced at 13. I came in just for um, I guess like a preliminary stage of the career, um, just to see where I was at. We did a little recording to, so just so that I can get a feel. The first time I was here, I kind of like walked out thinking, wow, like I really felt at home. You don't know how to channel it. You've been scared to open up cause you don't know who you could trust and I don't blame you. I don't blame you. And ever since then, I've just been coming back every Saturday, just recording and getting ready to prepare a project. There's something about artists, um, and I'm a little biased. I would say musicians. I find them very humble. I find them incredibly generous to share their talents and their experience. And uh, it's been 50 wonderful years that I didn't expect <laughs> that I would be here, but I am. And it's been an incredible ride. That was Talia Ricci with that story in Toronto. Up next, an apology from Canadian tennis star Bianca Andreescu. I could have definitely used a different choice of wording, um, so I apologize to anyone I disrespected. We'll tell you what prompted that at the U.S. Open. Plus, her conversation with Andrew about what she learned when she stepped away from competition during the pandemic. Canada's Bianca Andreescu won her first round match at the U.S. Open on Monday. Andreescu bounced back from a rough start after strong winds kept blowing her skirt up. The 22-year-old requested a break, blaming her sponsor Nike, for which she later apologized. I could have definitely used a different choice of wording, um, so I apologize to anyone I disrespected. I mean, I love Nike and I hope I can be with them for the rest of my life. The 2019 U.S. Open champion ended up defeating France's Harmony Tan in three sets, advancing to the second round of the tournament. Andrescu has bounced back from some major challenges in her career. After shooting to the top of pro te tennis, she had to deal with a serious knee injury and then COVID hit. Andrew Chang sat down with Andrescu between training sessions last spring to talk about her comeback and the children's book she wrote in the meantime. Well, hey there, Bianca. How are you? Very good. I'm training well, I'm healthy, and I'm getting ready for my first tournament back. Can I ask you about the road to getting back? Because you've had a lot of ups and downs. So, I don't know, maybe I'll ask you the very first question I asked you again. How are you? Yeah, it's definitely been a bunch of challenges, some struggles, and a lot of tears, but... I am good now. Yeah. I think the past couple of yeah. years really shaped me yeah. into who I am right now. Beauty. And one of my main Beauty. goals was to yeah. learn how to love myself more and the game that I play that I once really, really loved. Now I, I think I'm back at 100%. And um, I'm just, I'm, just excited for what's to come, honestly. For your opponents, that's got to be a terrifying thing to hear. Bianca Andrescu at 100%. Yeah, I hope so. I hope they get intimidated. But you talk about that struggle. You talk about the tears. I mean, I can't help but think about a social media post that, that you had written, I think it was just a couple of months ago, where you talk about feeling like you had the weight of the world on your shoulders. I mean, that, that, that sounds like a pretty dark place. Yeah, it wasn't easy. I mean, the main reason I had to take this break was because I just did not feel in the right place at all in anything. Um, I felt like I stopped enjoying myself on court. And one of my main goals is 
to enjoy myself on court. So when I saw a continuous pattern of me not being able to do that, I knew something was wrong and something had to change. It's looking increasingly difficult. This is such a shame. Just give us your thoughts on today's match. I felt like I identified myself too much with the sport. The external pressure was getting to me. I don't really know what to say. I put a lot of pressure on myself already, but when I wasn't doing well, that's when I didn't hate myself, but I was just so negative. And that's why I wanted to learn how to love myself again, because I really wanted to figure out what that was. Um, I started doing other things. I did martial arts. I played a lot of basketball. I traveled. Um, I worked a lot on myself in many different ways. I read a lot. I wrote a lot. And it's really, really helped me. And I wouldn't change what I did the past couple of months for anything in the world. How's your three-point shot? <laughs> it's actually not that bad. Um, <laughs> I am better at defense than shooting, but I mean, we can go for a match. I don't oh, mind. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not saying I have a good three point shot. I could show you what I got. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I would take that opportunity in a heartbeat. Let's talk about this BB's Got Game. Uh, all of your, I mean, your fan, oh, yes, you've got one too. Uh, yeah. All of your fans are going to be wondering why. Why is one of the best tennis players in the world writing a children's book. So I've wanted to write my own book for a couple of years now. And even though it's my own personal experience, I wanted to create something that's more universal and classic so that um, more people can relate. And I started off with a children's book because I think a lot starts at a very young age. Um, you know, habits, mindset, uh, characteristics, personality, all that. And I basically talk about the importance of meditation, never giving up, visualization, and just achieving your goals by believing in yourself and going for it. With the help of your family. I talk about my family a lot as well. And Coco. And Coco, <laughs> I was about to say. Coco is my inspiration. She teaches me how to show unconditional love for myself, for everybody around me, as much as I can. It's not easy because it's so easy to quickly judge someone, quickly judge yourself. But every time I look at her, that's what she reminds me of. Yeah, she's just incredible. I have to put you a bit on the spot. C can you open up your book? And if there are, I don't know, so just some, some parts of that book that really resonated with you when you were writing them, when you were thinking about them? And, and could you read those for us? Yes. Uh, okay, let me think. Okay. I feel my body relax. I notice the warmth of the sun on my strong arms, the cool breeze on my face, the chirp, chirp, chirp of the birds. In this happy, peaceful place, I realize the most amazing thing. My gloomy thoughts aren't the boss. I have the power to change how I think. From that day on, every morning when I wake up and every single night before I go to sleep, I take three slow, deep breaths and I think of all the things I'm grateful for. Why, why was that an important passage for you? Uh, because I just remember the moment when I did feel that way for the first time. I was 14 and I was going through a pretty bad injury. And that's when my mom really showed me meditation and visualization, the true power of it. And after a couple of months is when I truly, you know, got the hang of it. Because at first I'm, I was super impatient. Like I couldn't just sit there and, and do that. But I just remember that exact moment when I did feel all of the things that are, are written in the book. So that's really, it's, it's a great <laughs> Okay. Um at the very beginning of this interview, you said that you were at 100%. Are you hungry? Are you happy? Are you satisfied? What's the feeling? I would definitely say that I'm at peace with myself finally. And I know that it's a work in progress because there are some days where I'll still get down on myself. 
But what I've learned is, you know, when I am feeling like that, what can I do to get out of it? That's the one thing I learned. And that's why I can say I'm at peace with it. I'm hungry. I'm definitely motivated to come back. And I don't have many expectations for myself because it's my first tournament back. And I'm kind of going in it as a new Bianca in a way. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely ready. Bianca, I cannot wait to see you tear it up on the court. I, I would wish you luck, but I don't think you need it. Uh, thank you so much for chatting with us today. I appreciate that. You're too sweet. Thank you. Up next, a big challenge for the school year ahead. Wet, water, and wish. Helping kids get back up to speed after two years of disrupted learning. With the return to school just around the corner, tonight we're revisiting a story about the lingering impacts of the pandemic on students. Deanna Sumanak johnson shows us how math and literacy skills suffered and the efforts now to catch up. This 11-year-old already has big dreams. Isabella Creel is hoping to take an international business program in high school, then attend university abroad but she's hit a big obstacle. Her math mark plummeted this year. So let's, this one is fine, this one's fine. Mother and daughter suspect it's a result of the cumulative disruption of the pandemic. The first report card this year was uh, went from 78 to 40. And to me, that was really alarming. I don't think it's really fair how fast we do one thing and then once we finally get used to it, we quickly move to another. Isabella is not alone. Last year, a Quebec survey of elementary and secondary students found that one quarter of them were failing math, far higher than usual. And in many other regions of the country, students' performance in math and another key subject, literacy, lags behind the pre-pandemic levels. This education professor looked at Alberta's standardized literacy tests from last year and found that some students in the youngest grades were 8 to 12 months behind where they should be. This school year, the gap deepened even further. Many classes went online. Many teachers were sick and they were uh, replaced by substitute teachers, which disturbed the learning and the sequence of teaching. The solution, he says, intervention classes like the ones he designed, already happening in Alberta schools. Wet, water, and wish. Specialized teachers like Lisa Michael meet with students who need help three to four times a week for about 35 minutes. If students don't have the reading and writing skills, when they move into the higher grades, they lack confidence. And I've seen students that receive intervention, get really excited about their learning and have those aha moments of, I can do this, oh wow, this is awesome, it's getting easier for me. Okay, who knows this one? Just some of the ways kids are catching up so they can achieve their full potential. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, a BC man with a refreshing take on the morning commute. What does it look like I'm doing? I'm commuting to work. And they go, no way. And I go, yeah. Want to beat traffic? Well, that's one way, and it's our moment. This here is Brent Hobbs, and this is what he wears to commute to work. Not interested in sitting in a car, Brent swims to and from work, nearly two kilometers each way, twice a week. His commitment to an environmentally friendly commute is our moment. Good morning. Oh, just uh, super refreshing, eh? During a heat wave, no better way of getting to work. It's nice and cool. It's just me and the carp. I swim. I've been swimming my whole life. You know, I look for innovative, non-carbon polluting ways to get to work. And it's healthy, and I get exercise, and it's a bit off the wall. And I meet interesting people doing this. 
I meet tourists from all over the world who says, what are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? I'm commuting to work. And they go, no way. And I go, yeah, here's my work bag. Let me show you what's in my work bag. I carry this big red bag behind me. You can see I got my Globe and Mail in here and it's nice and dry. I got my towel, I got my work clothes. When I am swimming under the bridge and I look at that big stream of cars, I just say to myself, I could swim faster across that bridge than you can drive across that bridge. Well, stay cool today. Drink lots of fluid. So amazing, uh, but there are some hazards um, of the wildlife variety. Uh, there was one time when Brent was swimming along and got a little too close to a beaver, and the beaver with its big flat tail uh, let him know with a bit of a slap that he wanted him to get away. That's the National for August 30th. Have a great night.